So, so at another aspect of, of, of the psychic energy, you know, which I think could take many forms, if we go back to indigenous cultures like the Hopi in Arizona, you know, the, you could say that a culture like the Hopi chose to live in a very difficult environment uh, where water was extremely scarce and crops were extremely difficult to grow. And they chose to live in such an environment because they wanted to be challenged by nature to, to maintain a high state of initiatory, initiatory uh, awareness or consciousness, okay? They, they wanted to be able to, um, you know, be so in tune with the, with the forces of the, of the spirit world that their rituals would be uh, effective. Uh, there's a Cambridge anthropologist who spent a number of years with the Hopi, uh, and he was total skeptic and puricist, uh, but he admitted that, uh, to his surprise, um, he would go to these rain dances and uh, sometimes they would actually work. You know, it would be 120 degrees, blazing hot sun, the Hopi would dance for, uh, you know, half an hour and clouds would gather and rain would fall. And he said that this was absolutely impossible, um, you know, according to what he knew about, you know, from his background, but he had to accept that this was the case. He also said that some of the elder Hopi uh, had a certain kind of telepathic capacity where he would sometimes go to them with a list of questions of things that he wanted to learn about and they would answer all the questions in succession without him having to even look at, at the paper. But anyway, so, so I mean, and all around the world, you know, weather modification is something that uh, a lot of indigenous cultures, it's one of the main, the main orientations of their spiritual practice. So from my perspective, you know, looking at potentially this process of, of, of you know, an alchemical shift, in a sense, in our, in our planetary society, um, how interesting that it's almost as if, um, you know, our unconscious activity as a species has brought about um, this climate crisis, you know? Maybe that was the only way that we could force ourselves to access these latent or hidden capacities of the mind, of the psyche, that our culture has been so desperate to, to you know, suppress and, and ignore. So yeah, so I'm super interested in, in how that evolves in the next few years. I mean, I think, you know, it could be a lot of things. I mean, I'm very interested as, as a short-term experiment. Uh, one, of, one of the thinkers, I've already mentioned him a few times, who has had a big impact on me, was uh, Jose Arguelles. Are people familiar with him at all? Yeah. So he was one of the big thinkers about the Mayan calendar and um, kind of developed his own version of, um, uh, of their calendar called the Dream Spell, uh, which was basically looking at, at time as something you could reconstruct as a work of art, which I think is a very beautiful idea. Uh, but Jose had the idea that um, on December 21st, 2012, you could use the focus on that date to create a kind of uh, a event uh, in, in, the, in the psychophysical realm. Uh, that he talked about as the rainbow bridge uh, meditation. So his idea is that if enough people were to were to meditate going up to December twenty uh, first every week on a on a circumpolar rainbow bridge appearing around the planet Earth, we could actually bring it into manifestation. Now, does that sound ridiculous to you? How many people here think that we could do something like that? I actually do think so, and I, I, I maintain, even though I've gotten deep into this stuff and, you know, get tarred and feathered with like a new age brush stroke, I still try to maintain skepticism and distance and not get caught in the ideas. Actually, I really like this idea about beliefs that, um, I think you can, you, can, you can test, you can field test beliefs as long as you also believe that you metaprogram your own belief system. You know, so that ultimately you can always step back and reprogram your, your belief system. If you, if you don't believe that you also program your beliefs, then you're in big trouble. Because then you start believing something and you're like down a whole uh, rabbit hole. But anyway, so provisionally and, 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 and in actual fact, I think that this Rainbow Bridge meditation is, is very fascinating. Um, and, and I think of this very, very specifically because um, I've had a few experiences around rainbows. Uh, I also know that Jose did a workshop in the 90s where a number of friends of mine went that was all on this rainbow bridge meditation. They did it for a week, and at the end of it, they went outside and there were rainbows like all around the sky. Uh, a couple months ago, we had a uh, event with my company, a nonprofit organization, Evolver. We had a, we had a meeting in, in, Phil, in Pittsburgh uh, of organizers and people interested in what we're doing. And uh, we had three days together and had a lot of talks and, and different workshops and so on. And um, you know, during my talk, uh, the day before, I'd even mentioned um, you know, this idea of Jose's around the Rainbow Bridge. So we did a, a, a closing meditation together on Sunday night 
And literally one minute after the meditation ended, there was a double rainbow across the sky. You know, which of course could be coincidence, but but it does seem that that these things have have you know happen. You know, another another phenomenon I've noted a lot is um, you know rainstorms holding off at huge concerts. Like if you go to a huge concert and it's you know on the on the brink of a thunderstorm, sometimes that storm will just hold out until the very last moment of of the last note of the encore chord. You know, and then it starts to pour. You know, so I think there's a lot of evidence if we just look at it you know experientially that somehow we, we, you know, our, our human capacities are more interconnected with this uh, electromagnetic environment of the Earth and have much more of an effect on it than, than, than we know or, or understand. So, so how do we make this shift? What, what are the steps to doing that? Um, yeah, so, so that's really, I mean, when I, when I wrote uh, 2012 and then I, then I did this film, 2012 Time for Change, um, I became focused with the sense that it wasn't enough just to be a uh, thinker or a writer or a journalist, that, that basically my, my deepest understanding of this prophecy was that it's totally about participation, you know, and, and getting away from any idea that there's like a um, salvation out there somewhere that's coming. Uh, the L Lakota Indian who we interviewed in our film talked about it as, as our uh, salvation point mentality. You know, we expect there to be some savior or redeemer uh, ahead of us, you know, and, and that's a, 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 a sort of distortion of our culture. That's obviously the Christian conditioning uh, has created that. And then also that, 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 that feeling of a salvation point has now been transferred onto technology. You know, so, so a lot of people anticipate technology as, as a savior that uh, technology is going to make us immortal or it doesn't really matter what we do with the earth because we're going to fuse with uh, machines and, and upload our consciousness or whatever. Uh, there's actually a huge amount of money uh, being poured into uh, the sing what's called uh, singularity research um, you know, around issues like uh, nanotechnology and uh, you know, brain computer interfacing and all this stuff. And um, you know, I think that we have to step back and we have to think about um, technology itself, right? Like, I, you know, I think that we all agree in a way that, I mean, I'm not a Luddite, I, I, I'm sure people here are all using happily and joyfully even, you know, smartphones and, 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 and computers and so on. You know, so, so technology is obviously, you know, an aspect of the evolution of human consciousness. Let, let's say it's like an expression or a projection of our consciousness. Because we have a, uh, you know, a, 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 a idea we put it into manifestation, then, it, then that tool or that, that technology, whatever we've developed, that picture, reflects us back at ourselves. And then we iterate, we create another tool or another instrument or another, another technology or another artwork. And that, that reflects us back at ourselves in, in, a, in a new way. So part of this idea that um, we're entering this time where there's an acceleration of evolution of consciousness has to do with those feedback loops becoming faster and faster as we iterate these new tools and have these reflections and then reiterate, re re recreate them. Um, so yeah, so, so, so we need to think you know, profoundly about our relationship to technology. And you know, obviously Steve Jobs died recently and you know, for many he was a hero, you know, but he certainly wasn't a hero in many profound ways. Um, you know, for instance, the uh, you know environmental and social injustice you know under which those pro those, those Apple products are created, you know, and things like you know conflict minerals. How many people here know about know about conflict minerals in, in Africa? You know, so the the rare and precious metals that are going into our smartphones and all these devices are you know are available only in a small region of Africa, where it's led to three million dead through genocide. You know. So, so we have to think about like our technology and our relationship to it, and we have to find a path that, that makes sense for the future. Um, you know, which is not, I think, rejecting technology, um, but, but, but recognizing that we have to master technology. That we don't have to go down a road of progress just because it's there. It's not necessarily gonna get us anywhere. And in fact, in some ways, it's so important to take some huge steps back, <laughs> you know? Um,